Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that I feel will have a lot of very split opinions on, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion of all of the theories in the comments. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. GlassesUSA.com is a regular sponsor here on this channel and I am so grateful because sponsors really do help this channel stay up and running and I absolutely love their glasses and their prices. Now, if you're anything like me, you know how expensive glasses can be and how much of a hassle it can be to get them directly from your eye doctor. However, it's now so much easier and more cost-effective to get your glasses through GlassesUSA.com. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses for up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving the comfort of your own home, all for affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers over 4,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses, including in-house brands like Amelia E, which is the ones I'm wearing right now, which by the way, these are my new favorite pair of glasses, as well as Adido, which is what these ones are right here. Now, these ones are the Adido Bellina, and this is what these ones look like on me. I really love pretty much any glasses that have those little things that like hold on to your nose. These ones fit my face very well. And these are the glasses that I like to wear out and about because I just think they're so cute. And then these ones are the Adido Magnus. So I will also try these ones on. And I don't know why, but for some reason, I just love the aviator style on me. It's my favorite pair of glasses and sunglasses. But if I do say so myself, I would have to say the Amelia E ones are my favorite pair of glasses. These are the ones that I've been wearing to class and just around the house for everyday use. They also have designer brands like Ray-Ban, Gucci, Oakley, and so many more. Now, like many of you have heard me say before in my previous videos, with how high my prescription is being at a negative seven, I was worried that my prescription might be too high to get cute glasses because the glasses that I got from my eye doctor are super thick. I don't like wearing them out in public, but the ones that I've gotten from GlassesUSA.com have completely changed the game for me. With GlassesUSA.com, you can add any type of prescription to almost any pair of frames, including glasses, sunglasses, and blue light blocking glasses, which is what these ones are. GlassesUSA.com has definitely turned me into a glasses wearer. I used to wear contacts 24-7 because of how bulky and thick my old glasses were, and I only used to have one pair of glasses because of how expensive they were, but now I find myself wearing glasses pretty much all day, every day, because I have so many options and they actually look good on me now. The best part is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $30, and a free basic prescription lens is included with every pair. It's so easy, all you do is enter your prescription in online, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders, no matter how much you spend, and if for some reason you aren't happy with your order, you have 14 days to return for an exchange, refund, or 100% store credit, no questions asked. The exciting news is that by clicking the link in the description box below, my subscribers can sign up to get 65% off of their first pair, which is just so amazing considering that they are already so affordable. And if you like the glasses that I'm wearing now or any of the other pairs that I've tried on, those will also be linked down below. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link down below for 65% off of your first pair of glasses, 100% hassle-free. Thank you again to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. I will also be taking off these glasses for the rest of the video. I haven't quite figured out how to figure out the reflection. I really want to leave them on for a video, but I'm still trying to figure out the lighting situation in my room. So as soon as I figure that out, 100% going to be wearing my glasses because I just love wearing them so much. But for now, since there is this reflection, I will be taking off the glasses for the rest of the video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into the video. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved murder of Heidi Furkus. Heidi Erickson was born in Falcon Heights, Minnesota to her parents, John and Dorothy Erickson. She had two brothers, Peter and Joel, and she was very close to her family, especially her brothers. She was described as a sweet girl who was a follower of God and was very active in her church. She was sweet, 
kind, but maybe a little bit naive. In high school, she played tennis and basketball, sang in the choir, and was a very good student. She loved the arts and loved drawing, painting, and creating beautiful artsy cards for her loved ones and friends. Now, in 2003, after Heidi graduated from high school, she met a man named Nick Ferkus at a youth group at her church. Nick grew up in the same area as Heidi, they went to the same church, and he too was very active at the church. After two years of dating, 20-year-old Heidi and 22-year-old Nick were married. Now, Heidi had been working with her dad, working as an administrative position at a financial firm. And then Nick was the director of operations at a local carpet cleaning company. And by all accounts, the two had a pretty good marriage and a very good relationship overall. They often traveled together. Again, they were both very active in their church together and everybody around them said that they had an amazing marriage. By 2007, the two had moved into a nice three-bedroom home in St. Paul, Minnesota. The neighborhood was described as being quiet and small but decently well populated, but it was a safe neighborhood. Neighbors described Heidi and Nick as quiet, keeping to themselves, though none of the neighbors knew the two very well. But nonetheless, the two lived a seemingly happy and normal life together until that all changed in April of 2010. At around 6.30 a.m. on April 25th, 2010, 911 received a kind of strange phone call from Heidi. Now, I haven't seen anywhere that the actual audio of this call was released, but part of the transcripts have been made public. In the call, Heidi said that it sounded as if someone was trying to break in, and then she gave 911 her address. Then, there was a loud scream of somebody just screaming, no, and that was all that was said before the line just went dead. After this, the operator tried calling them back several times, but there was no answer, so police started making their way to the home. But then, as police were on their way, Nick called police once again to report that there had been a shooting. In the transcript, he said, help me, please, please, someone just broke into our house and shot me and my wife. He was screaming and sobbing hysterically and said, oh my Heidi, my wife is dead, please get here. He said that he had been shot in the thigh and groin, and he continued talking to the operator as police headed their way. When police walked into the front door of the home, they immediately saw Heidi laying on the kitchen floor after being shot. And unfortunately, at that point, she was in fact already dead. Nick had been shot in the leg, but he was actually alive. He told police that him and Heidi were the only ones at the home. Nick was taken to the Regents Hospital, was treated for his injuries, and was released that same day. Now, there are some conflicting reports on how severe the gunshot wound on Nick actually was. Some people said that it just sort of grazed his leg and that it wasn't very serious, but others had said that it was very severe and a very potentially life-threatening gunshot wound. I do want to kind of note that many people think that being shot in the leg isn't very serious or deadly, but it can be just as deadly as being shot in the chest. You have a huge major artery called your femoral artery running down the front of your leg, and if that gets hit, it can be very deadly. So I do just kind of want to put that out there that being shot in the leg does not mean that it couldn't have been severe or lethal because I know a lot of people say that in a lot of these cases that, oh, just shoot him in the leg or being shot in the leg isn't that bad, but it really is pretty bad. But either way, after being released from the hospital, of course, Nick spoke to police about what had happened. He told them that in the early morning hours of that day, so April 25th, him and his wife thought that they heard an intruder come into their home because they had heard a noise by the front door. He said that the two of them both went downstairs to investigate and he armed himself with a shotgun while Heidi was holding the phone calling 911. Nick said that as they were going down the stairs, he told Heidi to run away into the garage or into the yard to call police. As they were walking down the stairs, they both saw this hooded intruder standing at the front door, so Nick went and confronted him. This resulted in a struggle between Nick and this unknown person. During the struggle, Heidi was running away into a different room, but just as she was doing so, Nick's gun went off and shot her in the back. After Heidi was shot, the struggle did continue, so that is how Nick was shot in the leg. After the second shot, this is when Nick said that the intruder fled the scene without taking anything. Nick described this intruder as being a male of an unknown race, standing at 6 feet to 6 feet 2 inches tall, weighing between 200 and 220 pounds. And he said that he was wearing a dark-colored hooded sweatshirt, but 
Other than this, he said that he didn't get too good of a look at his face. Now, of course, police immediately went and investigated this scene, but right away, there were a few strange things that they found about this entire situation. First, when police entered the home, they said that there were no signs of a break-in or forced entry into the home. They had also said that the home seemed very secure and it really did not look as if someone else had been there. Also, right after the crime, of course, when he called 911, police went around the neighborhood to look for anyone that could have been the suspect fleeing the scene, but they didn't really see anyone that could have possibly been the suspect. Police also seemed to have pretty thoroughly investigated the crime scene. They spent two days within the home investigating everything and they said it did not appear as if there was any signs of a struggle. They did find some markings on the door which could indicate a struggle, but they also said that these also couldn't really mean anything. They could just be results of normal wear and tear. But then on the other hand, there were witnesses who could have been able to corroborate Nick's account of everything. Clifford Mitchell is a neighbor of them who lives down the street. He said that that morning at around 6.15 or 6.20 a.m., he heard a car pulling out really fast with screeching tires in the alley behind Nick and Heidi's home. He said that whoever this was was very clearly in a big rush to leave. He said that he didn't actually see this car or the person, he just heard the tires screeching. Then there was another neighbor who lived right next door to them who reported hearing yelling at around 6.20 a.m. This neighbor said that the person who was yelling sounded like they were in immense pain and like they were calling for help. This is assumed to have been Nick when he called police after being shot. He was yelling and was clearly in pain and was asking for help. However, what was weird was that this neighbor did not report hearing any gunshots. So it's a little bit strange that they heard Nick yelling, but they didn't hear any gunshots, which would have been a lot louder. So this does kind of make you question when the gunshots actually happened, if it was right before 911 was called or if it happened at a different time, or if there could have been some sort of silencer used or something like that. Now, police had also recovered the shotgun that had shot both Heidi and Nick. They were were able to confirm that there were in fact only two shots fired from that gun, which is exactly what Nick said. You also have to consider that even though there was no signs of a break-in, it's always possible that they just forgot to lock their door. I have forgotten to lock my door a couple of times and then in the morning I noticed that I never locked it and I kick myself because who knows what could have happened. Plus, if you live in a pretty safe community where not a lot of crimes happen, some people just don't think to lock their doors. It's something that can easily slip someone's mind and if you're an intruder trying to get into someone's house, your thought might be to just try all the different doors to see if any are unlocked so that you don't have to go through the trouble of breaking a window or breaking down a door and possibly waking someone up. I also want to point out that when it comes to there being no sign of a struggle, that may not be super strange either. It does sound like this was a relatively quick struggle. Maybe he just had his gun in hand, confronted the intruder, and then the intruder tried to grab the gun and then it went off off and then Heidi was shot and then the intruder tried to grab the gun again and then it went off again and then the intruder fled right after that. Maybe he was scared of being shot or maybe he was scared of someone hearing and police showing up quickly. Either way, it sounds like this entire interaction could have just been a few seconds long. Plus, if this entire thing happened right by the front door, there may have not been a lot around to fall into or knock over during the struggle. It could have been that no one was really pushed into anything or fell over on anything or knocked anything over. It could have literally been two men struggling, someone was shot, and then he left. So I do want you to consider these things that I just talked about as we go through the rest of this case. Now, like I said, those around Heidi and Nick said that they seemed like the perfect couple. However, as we see in a lot of cases like this, there was some information that came out that showed that maybe they were struggling a little bit more than people knew. Police had initially said that this information they found didn't really have anything to do with the case at hand, but the media and everybody else looking into the case pretty much jumped on it immediately and thought that it definitely could be related. So, turns out that Heidi and Nick had been facing some very severe financial problems. They had been spending so much money and living way far beyond their means. They had many unpaid bills, they had huge credit card balances, and their house was being foreclosed on. In fact, they were set to be evicted from their home the very next day, April 26th. Their house had been sold at an auction in June of that previous year, and they had been receiving many eviction notices, but they were still living 
living in the home. They had been living in that house for many, many months without paying anything. But despite them being set to be evicted the very next day, there was absolutely nothing in the house that was packed up. It did not look like they had any plans whatsoever to vacate. There were still pictures up on the wall, clothes in the dressers. Their furniture was exactly where it was supposed to be. There weren't even any boxes or containers anywhere that showed that they had any indication that they'd even planned to move. Heidi's mom even said that she does not think that Heidi even knew that they were being foreclosed on. Heidi's mom is confident that if she knew, then she would have told her. Apparently, Nick was solely responsible for their finances. Anything that Heidi knew about their finances was information that Nick had told her. It wasn't until after Nick was released from the hospital that he went to Heidi's parents and told them about the eviction. He told them that Heidi was very well aware of this, but they did not believe him. They were confident that she did not know about this. Now, there was one instance a few months prior where Heidi told her mom that they were having some problems with their bank account, but they were saying that the bank had messed something up up and that Nick was working on it. She said that she was worried about this issue with their bank account, but Nick was doing whatever he could and was getting it resolved. She had also told her mom that her and Nick were looking for a new home and considered renting somewhere temporarily. She said that she wanted to do a short sale of the home because she wanted to downsize. She wanted a new home so that she could possibly start having and raising children. She said that she knew that they hadn't owned the house long enough to make a profit off of selling their house, but thought that it was better to move to a new house either Either way. During this conversation, Heidi's parents say that Nick was there, but he didn't say a single word throughout the entire conversation. A few days after the incidents and police were done investigating the crime scene, the house was handed over to the bank. So pretty quickly after all of this happened, Nick hired a lawyer, but he was very cooperative with police throughout this entire thing. He handed over his DNA to police with no problem, and as we saw from before, he had no problem talking to police and sharing his side of the story. However, he did eventually stop talking to police pretty much altogether at the advice of his lawyer. Nick's lawyer, Joe Friedberg, said that from day one, Nick was being treated terribly by police. They said that they made it very obvious from the very beginning that they were treating Nick as a suspect. And that is why Friedberg even got involved. He knew that Nick was innocent and thought that it was wrong that police were treating Nick as a suspect when he was a victim who had just lost his wife. Then on the on the other hand, police were saying that there were so many more questions that they wanted to ask Nick, but he wasn't talking. Friedberg came back and said that Nick couldn't have been more cooperative. He spoke with them at great lengths and said that he told Nick not to speak with them anymore because he had already provided them with all of the information that he possibly could. So that next month in May, Nick and Friedberg had worked together to hire a private artist to come up with a composite sketch of the suspect. This was a bit strange to police because we don't really know why they decided to go to a private artist rather than a professional police sketch artist. It was also a bit weird to them because when Nick gave police the initial description, he said that he couldn't say what the race of this man was, what age he really was, or give any other details about his appearance. But when they released the sketch, it showed a dark-skinned man with very detailed facial features and said that this man was between the ages of 40 and 60 years old. So it seemed like he remembered much more about this suspect several weeks after rather than just right after the incident. Police released this image on May 14th and while they did receive some calls and some tips, police said that nothing really helpful came from any of them. So the next thing police did was gather information about Heidi and Nick's finances. They too said that the couple was in severe financial distress and it appeared as if Heidi had no idea about all of these financial issues. Apparently, they had gone on a recent trip to Hawaii together and Heidi told her mom that Nick was paying for the trip with bonuses that he was getting from work. It also looked like their house was just full of new and expensive items. Police thought that Nick was trying very, very hard to cover up the massive amount of debt that the couple was in. And like I said at the beginning of this video, Heidi was described as being a bit naive. So it's thought that maybe she just didn't even think to distrust her husband or look into their finances. She may have just trusted him completely. I also want to note that the day before Heidi was killed, she had gone shopping with a friend at the Mall of America. 
They had gotten dinner together and Heidi mentioned that the next day, the day she was killed, she was gonna go get a pedicure. So there was absolutely no indication that she knew about their financial problems or that she was going to be evicted. You would think if she was going to the mall with her friend, she wouldn't be talking about getting a pedicure. She would be talking about how she's gonna get evicted and what they're gonna do and what their plans are and how they're gonna save money and pay back their debts. Plus, they had absolutely nothing packed. They had absolutely no plans of any sort of new living arrangements. They didn't ask either Heidi or Nick's parents to stay with them. They didn't book a hotel or any apartment. So the evidence really did point towards Heidi not knowing. So all of this is just building and building and giving police a reason to suspect that maybe Nick did have a motive. Now, I will say right off the bat that I saw absolutely no reports of him receiving any sort of monetary benefit from his wife dying. I don't see any sort of life insurance claims or anything else like that to show that he gained anything from this. However, it could be seen as a motive that he was just lying for so long and gotten them into to such a deep hole that he felt that this was the only way out. We saw a very similar situation in the Lori hacking case where her husband was lying for so long that when she found out, he killed her because she was going to leave him and expose him. There was no monetary gain from this. He just wanted to cover up his lies and he didn't want to take responsibility for them. Being in such a deep financial hole requires him to lie to Heidi and mislead her for so many months and maybe even years. Imagine thinking that you have this life where your husband is just taking care of everything to suddenly finding out that the man you're spending your life with has been lying to you so badly for so long. That can mess a person up pretty bad. So maybe she found out and freaked out and he killed her because of that. Or maybe she never found out to begin with. But she was about to find out when people were about to come knocking on their door and tell them that they were being evicted. Plus, she was talking to her mom about wanting to have kids and live in a new home. He may have also been scared that after she found out about this, that she would leave him for someone else who was able to give her that life. I think the fact that they were literally scheduled to be evicted the very next day that she was killed is far too big of a coincidence to just ignore. So let's just entertain this idea and how it could have happened. So we know that Nick is a day away from his wife finding out that he has been lying to her for months and maybe even years. She is about to lose her home and her life as she knows it because of Nick. Who knows how she's about to react? Who knows what she's going to do? So they go to bed that night and Nick plans this way to get out of this big mess. Or maybe Nick had planned this from the very beginning. I don't really know. If Heidi was in a deep sleep at around six in the morning, it wouldn't be hard to wake her up and while she's still out of it and groggy to act all panicked and tell her there was an intruder. I know that there are some times where I wake up and I'm so out of it where I hear things that aren't even there. So I can definitely see that if someone woke me up and told me there was an intruder, I bet my brain would have told me that I heard them. I don't think it's too hard to convince someone that they heard noises when they were out of it and still groggy after just waking up. So if she was startled awake thinking that something horrible was happening, she's immediately going to turn into fight or flight mode. She's not even going to be thinking about anything else. She's not going to be like, hmm, I wonder if I actually did hear something. She's just going to try to get the both of them to safety. That's all she's going to be concerned with. So he comes up with this plan where he says that he's going to take a shotgun, then tell Heidi to call 911 and then run into another room. So that makes sense why she initially called police saying that she heard an intruder. Then as she's running into another room, she shot in the back. Now, I feel like some people may ask why she would be running away if there wasn't even an intruder there, but I think it's possible that she wasn't even really looking for the intruder, that she was more concerned with just getting out of there and running away. I feel like she would have tried running away from the scene whether she saw someone or not. So even if there wasn't an intruder in the home, I don't think that she would have noticed. I don't think she would have bothered to look around for them. I think that she would have just been more concerned with getting out of there and getting herself to safety. I think that he probably did it this way because I think he did love her and I think he cared about her. So there's no way that he could possibly look her in the face as he shot her. It would make sense that he waited for the moment that she turned her back to him and that is the moment that he shot her. I think that when he called 
called 911, he was absolutely frantic and panicked because first of all, he was in a lot of pain because he literally just shot himself in the leg, but also because the woman that he married and shared a life with for so many years was now dead. I think that if he shot someone who he did truly care about, that he would have been in shock and horror at what he had just done. Now, another thing that I personally want to point out is that I do think it's a little bit weird that she came downstairs with him to check if there was an intruder. I understand that it may have technically been safer for her to get downstairs and get outside and run away from the house to avoid getting hurt. But I feel like if there is an intruder inside the home, it's pretty dangerous to be walking around inside without any sort of self-defense. So I picture that, of course, Nick grabbed his gun and told his wife that there's an intruder. So that means that they would split up, leaving her defenseless. That is honestly really dangerous to me. He doesn't know where this intruder is. So what if he ran into the backyard and there was someone there? What if this person was already in the garage when Heidi went in there? Or what if this person saw Heidi as she was running away and shot her then. I personally think that if there truly was an intruder that Nick would have grabbed his gun and told Heidi to wait or hide in the closet of their room to make sure that the intruder wouldn't see her and wouldn't hurt her and that he by himself would go downstairs to look for them. There's really only one way to get up and down the stairs so if Nick was already on the stairs waiting for an intruder with a gun, they wouldn't have gotten to her. I don't know, but to me, if there was an intruder in the house, I definitely would have my boyfriend or one of my male roommates go out and look for me. Honestly, that might sound like anti-feminist or something, but that's personally what I would do. And I feel like a lot of other women would do the same thing. I wouldn't wanna move because I would be too terrified. Again, that might just be me and maybe that's not the safest route, I don't know. But I personally think that it's a little bit weird that she went downstairs with him to look for this intruder without having any sort of self-defense. If I did decide to go out and look for an intruder with my boyfriend, you best believe that I would be armed or carrying my knife at the very least. The other strange thing is that if Nick and this intruder did have this very close interaction with each other, so close that the intruder tried to grab the gun from Nick, how did he not see anything on his face? I get that maybe it was dark with all of the lights off in the house, but one, your eyes will adjust to the dark and I feel like he would have seen at least some sort of notable feature about this person his hair, his race, his eye color, something. Plus, police interviewed many people around the neighborhood and not a single person reported seeing anyone running away from the home, entering the home, or even seeing this guy's car driving away. Only one person heard tires screeching and that was it and I don't think anyone even heard the gunshots. It was 6.30 a.m. when all of this happened, and like I said earlier, this neighborhood is decently densely populated. I also looked up the sunrising times in April in Minnesota, and it looks like sunrise is right around 6.45 a.m. So that means by 6.30 a.m., it definitely would have been decently light outside, and it would not have been pitch black. And I feel like there would have been at least a couple of people awake at that time, either getting ready for work or church, since it was a Sunday or walking their dog or getting their mail or making their coffee or something. But not a single person in this entire neighborhood saw anything. Now, if it were four or five in the morning on a Sunday, I can definitely see how it may be too dark and not many people would be up to see anything but lots of people are up by 6 or 6.30, so I think it's just weird that not anybody saw a single thing. Then, on the same note, when it comes to it being decently light outside and at around 6.30 a.m. when this happened, why would an intruder choose this time anyways? People are going to be up. People are going to see you. That's a pretty stupid decision that if you're gonna go rob someone, that you wait until it's just light enough outside for people to see you. Another thing that I want to talk about is that we know when Heidi initially called police, there was a loud noise and then someone screaming no, and then the call just dropped. Why? What made it so the phone just suddenly disconnected? I think this may have been when Nick shot her. Maybe he shot her and then ran to her and hung up the phone or maybe when she dropped it, it hung up by itself. I don't really know. The other really weird thing is that Nick had told police that he saw someone standing by the front door. In one statement, he said that he saw them at his front door, but Heidi was found in the kitchen as she was running to the back door. So I don't know if Nick had changed up his statements or if it was just reported differently, but during this initial call and statement, he said that there was an intruder by the front door, but then apparently there were other sources and interviews 
interview saying that he saw this intruder by the back door and that's how Heidi ended up being shot in the kitchen. Then we know that the witness heard tire screeches from the alley behind their home. So this would mean that this person parked their car in the back alley and then walked all the way around the house, walked in through the front door facing the road where people are much more likely to see him and then enters that way. Now, I will concede that if you think about it enough, it makes sense. Maybe he parked back there and then went through the front door because it's probably easier to break into someone's house that way. Like I said earlier, this person could have been just trying to play around with people's doors and figure out who was unlocked. Then maybe after entering through the front door, he planned to walk through the house, take a couple of things, and then leave out through the back door to get to his car quicker. That way, no one would see him drive away, making it much harder to identify and capture him. Even if someone did see him walking in, it's much harder to identify someone based on a description of, you know, a neighbor saying him saying, oh, he's this tall, he was wearing this, than it is to locate someone based on a description of their car, you know, the make, the model, and maybe even the license plate if someone catches it. So I won't totally discount this factor as it being super strange, but it is just a little bit weird and confusing. But nothing was stolen. So even if we argue this scenario, and that's why he was found by the back door because he was making some some sort of escape and maybe the report was really that they heard someone by the front door but that you know the person got into the back door by the time they saw them nothing was taken so that really doesn't even make any sense because this all means that this person would have broken in through the front door and then walked through the house without taking anything and then was about to leave with nothing the only thing that would make sense is that if he heard them coming and then just ran to the back door to get out immediately without taking anything i could see that if you make it make sense but again it's not the scenario that makes the most sense plus again i'm not even sure whether he said that he saw the intruder by the front door or the back door. This is all based on him saying that he was by the back door, but again, he initially said that he saw the intruder by the front door. So if this entire thing was planned by Nick, it was honestly done kind of smartly. Him having Heidi call 911 to report the intruder makes this entire thing just that much more believable. And he does seem to have the motive. Police have come out and said that they have not ruled him out yet as a suspect. However, just to play devil's advocate here, I will say that Nick's lawyer came out and actually said that the couple was not in as much financial trouble as police made it out to seem. He said that police greatly exaggerated and overplayed how much debt they were truly in. He said that his law firm did their own investigation into the couple's finances and said that they were not in as much debt as police said. They said that they also had very strong evidence that shows that Heidi did know how much debt they were in. They were even looking for a new residence to move to shortly before the shooting. And as far as I have seen, Heidi's parents and family don't think that he's responsible. I may be wrong because I've only seen sources from a year or more ago, so maybe their feelings had changed, but they've supported him for the most part as far as I have seen and they truly believe that this was an intruder and that this person is still out there and that they need to find justice for Heidi. I also want to point out what I mentioned earlier about him suddenly remembering what this intruder looked like weeks later. Obviously, most people have said that this is very suspicious, that you don't just magically remember details after an event had happened. However, this type of thing actually isn't all that uncommon. It happens pretty often where a victim of a traumatic event doesn't really remember right after the event because they're just in so much shock. I'm sure Nick wasn't looking intently at this person's face while just trying to fight him off. Some people do truly just go into override during these situations and they genuinely cannot recall any details right after it happens. Then as time passes and the anxiety goes down, details start coming back and they start remembering what happened. So I don't just want to jump to this being suspicious because this does happen a lot in a lot of true survivors cases. But but again, they were being kicked out of their house the very next day. They didn't have anything set up and they didn't ask either of their parents to stay with them. Looking at new places to live is great, but that doesn't mean anything when you have to leave the very next day and you have absolutely nothing secured. Plus, the lawyer saying that they weren't in as much financial trouble as people think is a little bit weird because they were literally being evicted. That's pretty black and white. That's pretty bad. It shows that they were 
probably in a lot of financial trouble. I also feel like Heidi would have said something if she knew. She seemed to have very understanding and supportive parents, so I feel like even if she was uncomfortable with telling them, she would have told her parents and may have even asked to stay with them while they get back on their feet. I just think that given what we know, it is most likely that Nick is responsible for taking Heidi's life. I think that they were in such a deep hole that Nick felt that he had nowhere else to go. I think that he thought this entire thing very through and planned it very meticulously and just hasn't been arrested because there's just not enough evidence. But even as I say this, I still wonder if there really was an intruder. I still have to wonder why. Even if you were in such a deep hole and you were lying for so long, why would you think that your wife being killed is a good answer because obviously he should know that police are going to look into him. He should know that police are going to look into their finances. He should know that they will find all of these very suspicious things. So it's just weird to draw so much attention to himself just to get out of this hole that he was in. But again, we know that not everybody thinks all of these things through logically. They just do what they think is best in the moment, I guess, and don't really think about the repercussions after that. He may have been so clouded by fear that he was going to be caught by his wife that he wasn't really considering that he could be caught by police. And if we look at him right now, I guess he really hasn't been caught. He is able to live his life right now and who knows if he's going to ever go to jail for this. So as you can tell, I'm pretty much split on each side, but I do think that it's more likely that he did take his wife's life but I do think that if this was ever brought in front of a judge and jury, I don't think he would be convicted because there's just not enough evidence and there's plenty of reasonable doubt. I am really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think because while I do tend to lean more towards Nick being responsible, something is telling me that it is possible that it was an intruder. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments because I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say. You guys always bring forward such interesting theories that I never even thought of, so don't be afraid to comment your thoughts below. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. Whether it was Nick who took Heidi's life or if it truly was an intruder, Heidi still deserves justice, so hopefully by sharing this story and getting more people's eyes on it, we can figure out exactly what happened and figure out how to get her justice. But but if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Also, don't forget to click the link down below and head over to glassesusa.com for 60% off of your first order of glasses. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!